Hello everyone and welcome back to an episode of Living with Happy. Today I'm really, really excited. We have two guests in my own home, so not via Zoom. <laughs> um, and they will be leading the conversation. Uh, first let me introduce my colleague, Lena, and then she will introduce our guest. So Lena, why don't you take it away? Okay, hi, my name is Lena Malia Itulua, and I'm the program associate here at SFFB Free. And I'm a Samoan, I'm a Pacific Islander, and I have with me um, my friend Nita Maile, who is also Samoan and Tongan. Our families uh, go way back. We're like three generations into being friends. And so Nita's gonna share her experience about hepatitis B with us. So Nita, go ahead. Hello, like they said, my name is Nita Maile, and I'm from the Bay Area, I was born and raised. My dad, who uh, passed away from hepatitis B, he is from Homa, from the village of Homa, from Tonga, uh, by way of Nukunuku. And my mom is Samoan, she's from Utule. Um, and so we come from a long legacy of Polynesian heritage, and they migrated in the 70s uh, to America. Thanks, Nita. Um, uh, it's so important that we introduce uh, our families in our culture as Pacific Islanders because we have to determine and establish that relational space first. So culture, uh, just to be uh, culturally correct, we have to establish who we are and where we're from. So thank you for that little history. Um, I just want to ask you, Nita, you know, could you kind of share with us um, so, like who your dad was and how was it having your dad as your dad? Yeah, um, my dad was a super fun guy. He uh, was always the jokester. Um, but back in the 80s, he actually had a brain aneurysm, mm. which probably threw off a lot of um, his health things in order to recognize hepatitis B because his brain aneurysm led to a full body stroke mm -hmm. and things like that. So he worked his the whole rest of his adult life getting back um, into trying to walk, into trying to remember to talk. The only thing he could remember was the Tongan language, which was really crazy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing because that was his native language. And so, um, but he was super funny, always a sarcastic guy. Um, so it was great. Yeah, I mean, I remember Kole too, it was awesome. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know that Kole could speak Tongan because he spoke English so much. Mm -hmm. But, um, Anyways, Nita, regarding your dad, like when and how did you find out that your dad had hepatitis B? Um, so he went through a lot of years of being in and out of hospitals and rehabs just physically because he was trying to get back from the stroke. So, um, so for 16 years, he was really sick, but it wasn't until the last year of his life that the doctors actually found that he had cirrhosis, liver cirrhosis, mm -hmm. which was caused because of the hepatitis B. And so they told him that he should probably prepare for the worst. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. So what were your initial thoughts and feelings about, uh, lear you know, upon learning about your dad's diagnosis of hep B? Um, we didn't understand a lot of it, I guess, because um, no one ever talks about hepatitis right. and to us or anything like that. And the doctor did tell us like he could have gotten it either from like because he's from the Polynesian Islands he could have received it at birth from his mother or um, he could have because he had so different blood transfusions in the 80s and things like that that he could have received it there also but the crazy thing was we didn't learn till till the end of my dad's life that my dad has seven brothers so there's mm. eight boys and they're and maybe half of those have passed away from liver cancer wow and i when i asked my cousins i'm like did your dad have hepatitis did you guys know ever check and then they were like oh we don't know we, we never knew because they were young when their dads passed away mm. and we were a lot older when our dad uh, passed away so like richard i'm going to kind of bring you in on this mm. so could you share with us like you know some important facts about hepatitis b and how it affects our lives and maybe talk about stigma yeah uh, i mean nita's first commenting on nita's story about both the unawareness and then uh, how it might have occurred in the family and we see this a lot um tragically well first folks don't get tested for it so um you would imagine and, and maybe this this did occur like when the brain aneurysm happened they usually do a barrage of tests, but maybe they didn't do, since it's a brain thing, a blood test for the hepatitis B. And if it was the liver cirrhosis that ended up, uh, unfortunately, leading to his passing, it's 
it's kind of crazy that they, you know, he was coming back from this huge other injury only to be undone by something that could have been prevented or managed mm -hmm. earlier, which is really sad. And then the family part, it's, and, you know, w when we interviewed Alan in one of our first episodes, the same thing. He's like, wait, Auntie, you know, Maggie has this. Aunt Uncle John has liver mm -hmm. problems too. Yet so often nobody said, well, did it have to do with that beat? And the most often answer is, I don't know. We never mm -hmm. asked or nobody ever said it because you don't talk about sickness or you just assume they got unlucky yeah. um, for hep B. And, and it plays directly into that stigma in a lot of East Asian and I imagine PI cultures. You have this, at least for us, it's, oh, if somebody gets sick, you don't talk about it. And you kind of like, it's like for at least in my family, it was like unlucky. Like you bring more bad luck or sickness into the family if you're talking about it a lot. Mm -hmm. Or people go, oh, if they find out that it was from something that it's a transmissible disease, like... Uh, hepatitis B, they'll connect dots and say, oh, it's because of bad behavior. You know, either they were sleeping around or they didn't eat clean food and stuff like that. So I'm wondering, uh, and that can create stigma, which it has in many countries. I'm wondering, do you think that played a part or was it more like nobody just knows about it? I think it's both. Like nobody knows about it, not enough to take action about it. And then also, um, yeah, the more you talk about, and I know in the talking community also, if you talk about death, it's most likely that you're going to bring it towards your yeah, family. Okay. And mm -hmm. so they won't. And a lot of Tongan men or Polynesian men in general, they, they feel like they don't have to go to the hospital, that it's not affecting them and they're okay. And they just pretty much dislike doctors in the hospital. Yeah. So they'll wait until they actually can't move or something yeah. is like literally falling off of the yeah. body that they're like, oh, I should probably get this checked. And the sad thing was we never heard about it and knew about it. So we didn't, we never had my dad checked either. So, um, when you did find out about that your dad had hepatitis B, like what are some of the things that your family did to, like, did you guys discuss anything? Like how you would go about, you know, learning about hepatitis B or like what steps did you guys take? Uh, we pretty much took, I mean, we did. We talked about it most definitely as a family. We talked about liver transplants mm -hmm. and things like that. We worked a lot with um, his liver doctor. He had a specialist that, um, would tell us a lot of information about it. Um, it wasn't really that it didn't click that it wasn't going to get better mm. but, uh, because you just think that it's going to get better. But, um, but it was, it was definitely something I wish we would have known more about, um, something that we could have taken care of earlier so that, um, things would have worked out differently. I, 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 I noticed you're getting a little emotional because you're thinking about your dad. Mm -hmm. I, I can understand that. Um, but, um, you know, looking back, is there anything you would have done, you know, differently or advice you would um, give your past self about this? Yeah, I would, have, I would have never thought that hepatitis B was such a big thing in, in the Polynesian Islands. So mm -hmm. I, I, would, I know I got checked after that and all mm -hmm. my siblings and things like that. But just to take precautions. I mean, why not, like, to know ahead of time than to... Um, have to deal with it when it comes. Uh, we talked about getting tested, getting our uh, my nieces and nephews checked, like all those types of things were important to us so that we could um, have a, a better way of living and to just to live longer, to want to be here. Yes, thank you, Nita. So you think hepatitis B impacts your life now and you know, how does it impact your life now? Um, I think I, I'm, I was, super aware now. I mean, it just makes me um, extra cautious. Mm -hmm. Like when people start talking about their parents um, taking them to the hospital, I'm always like, hey, you should have them checked for hepatitis B because mm -hmm. I know your parents came from the islands just like mine did. You know, and they're always like, oh, hepatitis, you know, because they don't know about yeah. it. They're like, why would we get checked for hepatitis? And then I have to go through my long spill about, <laughs> you know, my dad, we never would have thought that either. And it gets passed down through generations, like mm -hmm. from mothers that had it. And so um, I just feel like it, it changed my my awareness. Like even in wanting to talk about it, I wanted to, I wanted PI communities to know um, that you, you can take care of your families. You don't have to lose them to this. There's so many opportunities. PI communities love their parents. I mean, they would take them in no matter what. 
And so I just think it's an important way to, if you want to help your parents, get them tested. It's free, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. it's free. <laughs> they can be yeah. tested. And Richard, could you comment on how hepatitis B is a silent killer? Yeah, I, I mean, Anita, thank you for being so brave to share your story uh, here. Um, yeah, I, I mean, she's exactly right. The disease is, is preventable with a vaccine. Um, and, and of course, unfortunately, for those folks that didn't get the vaccine, um, still, if you catch the virus early when it hasn't done a lot of liver damage or hasn't become the liver cancer, uh, most people, more than 90%, live full, healthy lives. And that's why, you know, when Nita is so emotional saying, you know, you can help save your parents, it, it, you really can. This isn't a death sentence thing unless it's too late. And that's the tragic thing. If you just get tested when you don't feel sick, because again, remember for all of you listening out there, the vast majority, something like 90% of people who have chronic hepatitis B have no symptoms. They're not going to feel sick about it on it, or it, the symptoms might be so subtle that they think it's something like just fatigue or stomach ache, or might fall under another medical condition that they go, oh, this must be from you know uh, uh, diabetes or from this brain aneurysm or from something else. And and the other thing, and and remind was your father when he got his aneurysm? Was it all here in America or in? Yeah, Australia? it was all here in America. Yeah, so you you would think, you know, mm -hmm. wouldn't my doctor have tested me for this disease that all these Asians supposedly have? Mm -hmm. And tragically, it's still in most cases up to each individual doctor to remember that. Asian immigrants and Pacific Islander immigrants are at risk for this disease and test them. There's no rule that they should be uh, tested or requirement by the federal government. Fortunately, in California, this past 2023, we helped pass a rule uh, that primary care physicians are supposed to be required to test for hepatitis B and C. Why I say supposed to is unfortunately... Uh, there's no punishment if physicians do not do this. So it's unclear whether they are actually testing. But we tried to, we passed that law to try to prevent this exact same thing, thing from happening so that when a parent, an auntie, an uncle, or just any new immigrant, could be someone in their 30s, comes to the country when they go first see their doctor, when they're at their first job, uh, or when they just get a chance, that they'll be tested for this and that they can catch the virus uh, really, really early so that it doesn't have to become um, something that devastates a family. Thank you, Richard. Mm -hmm. I think something that's really important that um, for our Pacific Islander community to understand is that when our, our migration story started, like our parents wanted to come here to this um, place, to the U.S. to um, build generational wealth, right? But we can't always think of generational wealth in terms of um, money, right? Uh, because you can't make any money if you're sick, you know? And so if you come here and you don't, you know, don't take care of yourself or, or take the uh, steps to go and get checked or, you know, try and live a, a, a healthy life or even just be educated about uh, the diseases that are out there and you get sick, you won't be able to, um, you know, progress, you know, you'll have a hard time. And so I think for our community, um, in the PI community, community education is, is key to our, um, generational wealth, you know, our, 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 our well-being. And so I think one of the ways that most of us can, you know, in the PI community can get help with hepatitis B is by contacting us, right? Mm -hmm. We have awesome programs, one called Under the Mango Tree, and then we have other um, programs where we come out and we teach the community about hepatitis B as we practice cultural um, tradition, like making TV filet, making haku, making money lay with paper. Um, also, um, kind of giving us the opportunity to come together as a community and learn, be educated, and be screened. Um, because we offer free screening um, for people who want to get uh, tested for hepatitis B. And so I think community education in the Pacific Islander communities and Asian all over mm -hmm. um, is important. That's the way that we would be able to um, 
tackle the uh, stigma um, and also teach you about how it is going to affect your family and your community later on. So um, is there anything else you want to share uh, or with, with our community about hepatitis B or if you, if you have any questions for us mm -hmm. about it? Um, no, but I thank you for this opportunity to share my story also. Uh, and I think it's an important thing uh, that people just undervalue because they don't know about it. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things in interacting much more with the Pacific Islander community is that sense of community and family. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'll say it, I'd much <laughs> rather hang out with y'all than my, my own family. <laughs> Shoot, like, oh, my family's so stuffy and, and stuff. Man, when I go to your guys' barbecue, it's like a hoot. When I go to my family gatherings, it's like, act proper. And eat your food quietly and talk a little bit, but don't talk too loud. Um, and I think that, I mean, Lena was just talking about it. There's that special opportunity to do these educations and break that stigma. And we've been doing that, as Lena said, through our programs. Um, and of course, if you still have questions, uh, you can visit us online at sfhepbefree.org. Or if you like Facebook, everybody's getting their information on Facebook. You can search us, sfhepbefree. Um, and there we have a phone line um, that uh, you can leave a message on. In English, uh, we, uh, it speaks Mandarin and Cantonese as well, but, and we will get back to you. Um, and it, of course, can come out and help do educations and, and screenings. Um, Lena, anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I think also, too, um, one of the most important things that I like to tell our community is that hepatitis B is a silent killer. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's important to know what your status is first, you know, so you know what to do. If you have to get vaccinated, if you've already developed natural immunities, or if you are infected. So know your status before you go and get vaccinated, and we can help you um, know what your status is. So just contact us, and we'll be happy to meet you under the mango tree. <laughs> yeah. I remember one more thing. Um, you might be hearing all of this and go, oh, well, does it affect Pacific Islanders statistically much more? And so uh, the reason why is in both a uh, lot of parts of Asia and the Pacific Islands, many more people in that country um, have a higher rate of hepatitis B. Uh, as l late as the 90s, the rates in many of these countries was about 10%, so one in 10. Since uh, the late 90s, there have been a bunch of vaccination campaigns, so those numbers have gotten much better. But still, in, I'm not exactly sure if it was American Samoa or, or some of the Pacific Islands have 3 to 6% of the population there still having hepatitis B. And that's uh, often because there is a less uh, robust vaccination campaigns on those islands with uh, less developed healthcare settings. So when those folks immigrate to the United States, those emigr uh, immigrants now have higher rates of it. And so it's important to note, again, this is not like a gene genetic component that's passed down. Uh, rather, it's passed most often in our communities through mother to child transmission. So that's just to answer the question on why it might be more common in, the, in our populations. But that's all I have today. So uh, Nita, thank you again for sharing your story. Thank you all for joining us on this episode of Living with Hep B, um, and we will see you on the next one. See ya. Bye. Bye. Bye.